You're listening to NFT 365, the first daily podcast on NFTs with your host, Fanzo. What's up, friends? Welcome back to another episode of... Well, actually, hold on a second. This isn't just another episode. This is episode 93, episode 93, and a number that uh, has always meant a, a big deal to me. Uh, it's actually, uh, as most of you know, the hockey number I wore growing up. Uh, and funny enough, you know, part of it was for me, I've always been one that likes, you know, I, I like to cheer for, you know, powerful, you know, great teams and great people. But I also am kind of one of those big believers in the idea of, you know, the underdog. And uh, I love, you know, I mean, you can tell that with my NFT projects. I like the slow burn projects uh, and the player that ended up, you know, shaking my hand first. Um, that I remembered when I was little, um, actually wore 93. His name was Peter Nedved. He didn't play very long on, on the Pittsburgh Penguins, but um, it made an impact on me and it became my hockey number, which I, I really appreciate. And so on this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, the conversations uh, around uh, NFTs and how you know, that conversation goes um, you know, with the haters, with you know, some of the things that are going on, and also how we can approach uh, you know, even our own, uh, you know, NFT strategy and things that are that are moving forward. Um, but I first wanted to, you know, you know, I've been really loving all of the feedback and conversation and really all of the things that have uh, been shared by, you know, those uh, in our reviews of the podcast, those that have, you know, commented and shared it amongst their community. And we got a comment, you know, on our a post that we posted on Instagram uh, yesterday. And I just wanted to highlight, you know, uh, I appreciate, you know, honest feedback. And I know that, you know, not everyone is going to love uh, this podcast or this style. And, and some people are going to, um, you know, have a, a different perspective and I respect all perspectives and, um, you know, NFT discord news on Instagram wrote a really long uh, comment and I appreciated the, the thoughtfulness of the comment. And, you know, it, it just, it said, you know, they started listening to the podcast three weeks ago. Uh, and they felt like the message from what was being said and they agreed with it, literally everything I was telling people. Uh, and then they said that, uh, that, you know, they, the conviction that I started to share uh, the, the pitches with that, you know, it started to be this concept where Brian is pushing it because it's now business and that benefits not only him, but his projects. And the person went on to say, and honestly, this sucks. I thought, man, this guy is about the people. He cares and, and wants what's best. And now it's just to promote this and promote that. And because he's involved, I saw him as the next it guy who got it. But now when I listen, all I'm waiting for is the pitch or the setup to tell me one thing is going to, to benefit all that he's involved with. And this isn't hating, he says, uh, or she says, I get it. It's a business. This is just listener's opinion. I compare it to being a fan of a superhero. And then that superhero goes in the, to the dark side and you're left thinking all about the good times and what could have been. And I just want to say, you know, I, you know, I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the feedback. Um, it, it's taken me a long while in this journey of being a public figure to recognize that I can't please everyone and that some people aren't going to appreciate um, the the way that I share things or how I, I do things. And and I will say, you know, part of the, the beauty of, of the NFT space is that, you know, anyone can create their own strategy and their own approach. And I will say with this podcast, you know, for me, it's an education play. Um, it's a play for me to learn and share publicly. But without question, there is a business behind this. Um, I have to make a living. I also have three daughters uh, to feed. Uh, I have spousal support, child support. I have bills. I have a team. Um, and so for me, you know, the idea that, um, you know, this you know, kind of connects a lot to that, you know, people that look at a band that they love the band when the band's selling their CDs out of the out of the back of their car. And then when all of a sudden the band makes it on the radio, they hate that band because they are sellouts and they, they like, how dare them, you know, become what they were seeking to become their entire career and how dare them go achieve the goals and things that they want. And the thing about that approach is that we have to, you know, respect and understand what people's you know views are, but I also think that the beauty of this space is that if you're willing to like listen and learn, and you're willing to uh, understand not just what is being said, but why certain things are being said, then I I believe that a lot of that idea of you know hey that band is a sellout actually changes because 
to me, this narrative in the creator economy is that it's no longer about, you know, the, the creator or the band making it and the fans being left behind, but all of us being lifted together. And so for me, when I, when I, you know, I, I read that comment and, you know, I work hard to, you know, value each comment the same. And, and I've said this before is that we often will spend an hour on, um, you know, the one bad comment that we get and we'll spend 30 seconds on all of the good comments that we get. But I just want to put this out there is that, you know, the, to me, this is a, we are greater than me conversation, right? And I will not speak out of turn. I will be a thousand percent transparent as I have been on, uh, every episode of this podcast. And I will also say that I am not afraid to, um, you know, amplify and share those projects and people that I believe in. Um, that's part of my mantra. It's the way that I approach things. I am not one that is going to speak out of turn or make claims about knowing something um, that I don't know. And this project, this podcast, this buying an NFT every day is the largest you know project that I've taken on um, in this form and fashion, right? You know, and the idea of not only you know where does this fit into you know, monetization and like the bigger picture for me and for all of those that are listening, you know, the beauty of this is that by you sharing the podcast, by you owning one of the NFTs of the podcast, and even by you owning the creator coins, this isn't a Brian is, you know, I'm selling out or I'm, um, you know, I'm lift, I'm going, I'm, you know, I'm going to become the, what is, what is, what it was the comment said left thinking, you know, that, that the superhero goes to the dark side. And, and I don't believe if we, we, we connect the dark side to people making a living, doing what they love, then, Hey, I am all about the dark side. But I look at this as that together we are growing together. We are learning together. We are listening. And I also just want to give a shout out, you know, big shout out to Tyson Ross, uh, good, good friend, you know, a major league baseball, uh, rock star who's been sharing out the podcast, sent me a really nice note this morning, um, about, you know, the fact that he has so many people in his circle that are looking at NFTs as like, Hey, this is a scam or, uh, this might be a fad or they don't really understand it or don't have like the open mind approach to it. And, and he's been saying that he's been sending out the, uh, episodes to, you know, those, you know, that can, you know, hopefully broaden their perspective. And I just want to say thank you to Tyson. I want to say thank you to, uh, you know, so many people that are out there, you know, Tracy and Drew and Erica and, you know, just even just in the last 24 hours. And the reason I wanted to highlight all of, you know, the amazing people, Mark, uh, Mark had a really nice post about five minutes before I started recording this is that, you know, I think it is important to look at this as a community. And I think everyone out there right now, I, I, this is gonna be my challenge to everyone is to you know, really think deeply about who you're listening to, and who you're following. And that includes me. And you have to ask yourself, does, do I have the values? And do I have the, the, really the conviction and, and is my strategy on approach something that aligns with yours that you are okay with leaning into? And if it is not, I am perfectly 100% believe you should find your people, find your tribe, find the people that speak to you in the way that you want to be spoken to, right? And that might be, you know, people that approach things a little bit differently, right? And, you know, I work hard at, you know, filtering the noise. Uh, the amount of projects that want to be interviewed on this show has got, you know, become almost, uh, you know, hard to manage, not even almost hard to manage, it's really hard to manage. Um, the also the, you know, when I'm interviewing people, and, and I hope people will see this and, and tomorrow's interview, I think you're going to really enjoy tomorrow's interview with uh, data NFT. You know, for me, a lot of it is, you know, I'm bringing on people that oftentimes have a different approach, but share my core values and beliefs for this NFT community. And because I believe that together we can change the world. I believe together we can open up doors that have never been opened before. And I want to share a quick story because the other night I was in a, a Twitter space with the, the Meta Whips team, which most of you know, I, I did an interview with them on, on the podcast. Uh, and they did a re really interesting campaign uh, over the last week as they... Um, they asked people to tag someone that was verified on Twitter and that they would give both the person that was verified as well as the person that was tagging them um, if they replied 
a meta whip and they picked four winners and, and really cool to see a couple, I mean, a, a bunch of people from the podcast uh, tagged me as well as tagging some others that were verified. And, and I actually won one with one of the members of our community, Carter. And uh, I ended up gifting that meta whip that I was given uh, to Kevin, Kevin, who was on our team, who is the intro voice to this podcast um, because he needed a meta whip. He didn't have a meta whip. And I just love that project. I love the team. But I will tell you, you know, I was in the Twitter space and for, you know, those that don't know about that project as much, you know, it's West Coast Customs, uh, you know, by far the most popular, most name brand um, custom auto uh, place that I know of in the world um, and one that made it, you know, had you know massive fame uh, growing up around like MTV and Exhibit and, you know, the, the Ryan and the founders, you know, Ryan as the founder and then the team, you know, I was able to interview uh, the team, you know, on the podcast and like, I just love everything they're standing for. And there truly are like the core slow burn project. But the thing I wanted to share was that, you know, in the Twitter space where people were talking about the project and they were getting up there and thanking them for winning the NFT, the emotion that was shared amongst people that were in this, in this Twitter space to me, not only did it make me emotional cause I'm an emotional person, but it reminded me a couple of core things here. And that is we, I often, and, then, and I'm guilty of this, that when I say things like community, sometimes I'm afraid if I say, Hey, the power of NFTs is in the fact that it unlocks the community aspect of, you know, our business and our lives and, and what we do online. You know, sometimes I will say like, what worries me is like, Oh, that's going to come across fluffy. People are going to, aren't going to, you know, they're, they're going to kind of look at that a little bit differently. And, the thing about it is when it comes down to it, when it comes down to life, when it comes down to, you know, where we, we prioritize things, how we look at the things that matter to us, we all want to find our people. We all want to connect and explore and find people that, you know, build us up, find people that are there for us. And let's face it in this digital world, that's a very difficult thing. And there were people on that Twitter space that jumped up and were like, hey, I'm a mechanic, I'm a construction worker, I'm a teacher. And they were explaining how just being involved in that discord f- allowed them to find their voice, allow them to find new opportunities in the digital space, really, and in some cases for many of them, allowed them to recognize that what, what social or digital or NFTs can unlock for them is something that they didn't know they needed but now that they found it, they can't believe they've been living without it. And, and a lot of that is that community. It's that unity. It's that, um, you know, someone that is looking forward to your comments, right? Like I will say, you know, there's a couple of people in our, in our discord today that really made my day. And, you know, they were posting that, oh my goodness, they woke up and they realized today was episode 93 and they got excited about it being, you know, episode 93. And to me, like, just knowing that like people are looking forward to this content, people that are, 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 you know, sending messages about how their life's changed, they feel less alone or they, you know, are, are open to new possibilities or, or the things that are, are there. And, you know, definitely shout out to native to Chris uh, crypto for that, that beautiful uh, comment to me that alone is makes NFTs valuable. It allows us to open new doors and connect in new ways that we didn't even know were things that we we needed or were missing. And I think from the outside, it's very easy to hate. It's very easy to kind of lump in a lot of the, the, the media noise and the trends that exist. But for me, I've never found much success in trying to change people's minds or to force people to change, right? Anybody that like, attempts to force anyone to change, I mean, I, we, I try it with my daughters, right? If I try to force my daughters to do something different, they're going to push even harder back. They're going to find even more reasons that they're right and I'm wrong. But if you open up people's perspective and you share, not from a place of trying to convince, but you share rather in a place of bringing someone along with you on the journey, you'll be amazed what happens. And it's why you'll hear me a lot talk about, I talk about this on Clubhouse and on Twitter and Twitter spaces, on, on uh, podcasts, 
where I really try to, to tell, remind people like, Hey, these are the stories we need to amplify. These are the conversations we need to put out to the public. And, and the reason I say that is because most of the time, the things that, that are brought to light are the rug pulls or the Justin Bieber might not have bought his NFT um, himself. He might have, you know, might have been a part of a, a partnership. And that's usually what hits the line, hits the, the headlines. That's usually what people um, on the outside are willing to talk about, because here's the thing. They don't have to know or understand anything at a, at a deeper level. They can simply say like, oh, there it is. You know, NFTs is a great place to to launder mon- laundry money and there's more places for celebrities to get rich and influencers to steal money from brands and and uh, take advantage of the everyday person. But if we do a good job of telling the stories about the impact of, of the things that we're involved in, the NFT projects we're involved in, that's truly how we move the needle. That's how we make you know a big impact. And, you know, funny enough, you know, I'm actually wearing a, a 2007 World Series of Poker uh, t-shirt right now for, you know and those that are watching this on on the videos on YouTube you know for everyone that hopefully you all know that um, almost all of the the episodes of the podcast except for the interviews are up on uh, YouTube as well I often add graphics um, to the the videos um, you know to kind of hopefully add some value in the the visual side of the house but you know, I'm wearing this shirt, so 2007 World Series of Poker, and, and this was the first year I ever went um, and played at the World Series of Poker in some of the, the large events. And, you know, over the next four years, I played every year at the World Series of Poker. And I, it so reminds me, so much of this space, of this NFT space, reminds me of a lot of the conversations I had around poker. And I, and I really wanted to connect the dots here on this episode because here's the thing is that it's not about trying to convince people to get into this space, but it's, it's about us not allowing other people's opinions to have us questioning things, having us stopping doing what we're doing. Right. And it's very easy to say like, I don't let other people's opinions uh, affect me because that's who I am. Uh, I'm going to call BS on that because I'm one that, you know, I, I know I can't please everyone, but that doesn't mean I don't want to, to please everyone. It also doesn't mean that others' opinions don't impact me. Like I know Gary V says that he doesn't let others' opinions, you know, get to him and it's why he doesn't read other people's books and he doesn't really consume a lot of other people's content because he doesn't want to let them influence them. And and that's one of the places I disagree with Gary on, right? Like for me, consuming, listening and learning to others allows me to add additional, you know, uh, you know, additional value to my own perspective and the things that I'm sharing, the things that I'm all about. And so the, the reason I say this connects back to the poker days is that when I would tell people that I was playing poker and doing it, you know, semi professional. And when I announced the sponsorship that I was being sponsored by poker, I had a lot of people that like, Ooh, what does your wife think of that? Like, don't you have like a kid on the way or, Like, Brian, I thought you worked for the U.S. government. You had, like, a legit real job. Like, you're gambling now? Like, Brian, like, how are you? Like, what are you doing? And and I would always laugh because, like, my comeback when anyone would say, Brian, you know, like, I can't believe you're you're gambling for a living. And I would say, oh, I'm not gambling. Like, I don't play blackjack. I'm playing poker. And... And they're like, what? And, and, you know, and this would also go where people, they were like, well, poker is not a real sport, right? Poker is about luck and... And I'm not going to get, I'm not get into silly debates about what's a real sport because most of those debates are coming from a place of insecurity from the person that's, you know, kind of putting that out there. But the reason I, I say that poker is not the same as gambling actually connects the dots to why I don't look at NFTs the same as I look at crypto. And, and it's not a knock on either one, right? I, I, I will, I will play blackjack. I like to play craps every once in a while. I'll play three card poker, um, you know, on occasion, but for me, poker is a game where I'm not playing against the house. I'm not playing against, you know, odds that are going to be, the, you know, like the the structure has like this, you know, kind of finite, um, you know, setup. For me, poker was about playing against nine other people at a table. I was playing. I wasn't playing against the house. I'm playing against humans. I'm also interacting with humans, and I'm able to use my own personal skill set to to improve my my possibilities of winning right it doesn't guarantee wins but it improves the way that i position myself 
And we think about that versus like blackjack, where we know that there's kind of a a recipe and rule book that you can, you know, when you, you know, you're going to hit, you know, are you going to, you're, you're, you're going to split on, you know, double sevens, right. And you're going to, um, you know, are you going to, are you going to hit on 11? Like what, are, you know, a lot of that like structure and you're playing against the house and the reason casinos are huge and make a lot of money is because let's face it, the house always wins, but the house doesn't always win in poker because the house isn't playing. The house is facilitating a game where they're taking a percentage of it to actually host the game inside of their casino or inside of their location. But I'm playing against other people. And that idea of playing against others really allowed me as not a math person, as not a, like a, a person that could read books and like directly, you know, implement what was going on. Now I will say I read more books on poker than I have on anything else in my entire life. Um, and I read and I also listened to books and I will say like the most Zen place for me in the world, there's actually two. One of them is at the poker table. Um, it calms my ADHD at a level that I can't even explain. I believe part of it is because of the, it allows me to hyper focus, but also it allows me to focus on a lot of different variables. And then the other place is my, my Zen place is the, is the stage being on stage as a professional keynote speaker. And it's because I can read the body language of the audience. I can keep an eye on the clock I can think about what I'm saying, but also setting up the stories and things that I have coming in the near future. And so I say all of that because when I look at poker and when I would talk to people about the strategy and the time that I put into poker and the amount of hours that I would watch, you know, for one year, I logged every single hand that I played in poker. Yeah, every single hand. Uh, I logged the starting hand. I logged, you know, what was the the reasons that, you know, um, actually had me playing that hand. And I ended up not doing really anything with that book of, of information other than it, it helped me keep myself honest. It also allowed me to kind of check myself like, oh, okay, when I play with my, you know, my favorite starting hand in, in Texas Hold'em is Jack Nine. And, uh, and, and, and I have, that has a little bit to do because of my favorite band uh, is OAR. And anyone that knows the crazy game of poker song, uh, it says I got three jacks and a pair of nines. Uh, and, you know, one, I, I ended up winning a tournament early on in my poker career, I think 2004 with a Jack nine and I played it very aggressive because of that song. And then when I won the tournament on, I was like, well, this is going to be my favorite hand, but I digress. Um, but the, the, but the reason I connect all these dots in there is that when I would start to share, not like telling people why they should, you know, think of, of poker differently than gambling, but I would explain to them the science and the math and the thought process and they would go, Brian, but like, why did you move all in there? Like, what was like, you only had king queen. Like, what were you doing? And I would say, well, based on what I looked at on the board and that person's playing habits for the last 18 hours, the range of cards that I could put them on was really at best a king queen as well, or at, you know, where I kind of expected them to be at a queen jack, um, you know, starting hand. And at this point of the hand, I looked at myself as a you know 78% favorite and that the amount of cards that could come out of the deck that were going to help me versus help them was going to be much higher for me. Therefore, for me, risking my, my tournament was worth it there. And that also, the things that would come into play there was like, do you play the same at a poker table when you're, when you're close to the money, right? When you're playing in a tournament and maybe the top 115 people get paid and if there's 117 people pl- left in the tournament, what is your strategy at that moment, right? Some people's strategy is to force people out of hands because they know people just want to make the money so they can tell their friends. Other people, they, they become play a lot tighter because they're like, hey, like there's, it's too high risk at this moment. Some people, that their only goal was to make the money and they're going to fold aces at the best hand in poker um, and Texas hold them at that point. They're going to fold that even in that moment because they, they're, they want to achieve that goal. And the NFT space is no different. Like you can listen to this podcast, you can jump into the NFT space and your goal and your like version of success might include only ever owning three NFTs. It might only end up being only one NFT or maybe it's you, you get into it originally thinking you're going to own a couple NFTs and then you own a couple more and then you start to build out your own strategy and your own methodology and then you launch your own NFT project. Or maybe you get into this space and you recognize like, oh, this is a, 
a place where it does fit my talents and my time and I'm going to lean in and, and maybe you start building out that bag of 50 or 100 or 300 NFTs. The beauty of this space and the beauty that I believe that, that so many of us have felt is that the opportunity for us to not only apply our own individual skill sets, but for us to find our own you know, version of success and open up new doors and possibilities is really endless and it's really dependent on all of us as individuals. I don't believe anyone should listen to those that are putting out you know, content around NFTs that are telling you there's only one way to do things. Or telling you that you, you know, or, or shaming you for, for flipping your NFTs or for um, mocking you for not making, you know, getting out of that project early, right? Like, like who, is, who are they? Who, is, who are those people that are, are wanting to push you that direction? And, and, you know, and for anyone that didn't see this, you know, this awesome video by Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, Gary was getting interviewed while he was in Dubai, I believe. Um, and, you know, on the, during the interview, um, and I, I'll put a link to, to the, we posted it on our Instagram account, but you know, the thing that I thought was really interesting is the person, you know, interviewing Gary, you know, was really claiming like, well, we know that like, you know, this, this internet space, this, this web crypto NFT space is, is the perfect place for people to, um, steal money. And it's where racism lives. And it's where, um, you know, the, the, the I think she might've even said like the Ku Klux Klan is, is empowered. And the way that Gary handled that question wasn't a, a matter of like, Hey, you're wrong or Hey, you're an idiot. But it, it was the element of, well, hold on a second. Like it's so easy for us to allow the narratives that we want in our head into something and make it like, Hey, it only exists in that space. Right. And like, and I think the most important thing about like even this whole NFT conversation is that, you know, we have to recognize that this isn't for everyone and everyone's going to find their own path. And some people are going to jump in, they're going to play around, they're going to find it really valuable, but then other things are going to become more of a priority in their lives. And I say, kudos, go for it, lean into it. I'm all about it. I will say that's not going to happen for me. I can pretty much guarantee that, uh, at least between now and November 11th. Uh, and I've said before, I don't see even slowing down after that. But like for me, I committed. I committed a year, you know, back on November 11th. I said, I'm going all in my business, 100%, everything, all in on this space for an entire year. I'm going to spend every single day, 365 days, I'm going to spend listening learning, adapting, sharing, amplifying, educating. I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to do that for 365 days and we're going to see what what happens. And I just think, you know, it's such an important, you know, conversation to be had and you know, it's kind of cool like because for me, you know, I appreciate the feedback that I that we got in that first comment that I read earlier, right? The idea that for them it, I went from the superhero that they were excited about that was going to become the it guy to becoming the, the person that went to the dark side. And for them, the dark side is, it was, is maybe my conviction for the projects that I'm involved in the, the, my, you know, the brands that I decide to allow to sponsor this podcast, or maybe it's the, how I talk about our creator coin. And that might be the dark side for, for, for that person that made that comment. But for others, that might be the door and the opportunity to be able to be a part of something from the ground floor. Because we're building something way bigger than me on this podcast. We're building something way bigger than anything from one individual with our ADHD coin, with the NFTs that we're collecting, with the project, the Mint 365 project. If I was in this for me, I wouldn't have shared 52% of the revenue with the community of those that are holding our Mint 365 project. And honestly, if I was doing this for me, I wouldn't have done a damn podcast. Because you know what? I'm giving everyone that listens to this podcast 100% unfiltered my thoughts, my strategy, my insights. Even if you're in our Discord and you're holding one of our NFTs, I connected up the one of the tools to where it gives you every action that I take from my wallet. You get to see every NFT I buy, every NFT I sell. You get to see every NFT I mint, every NFT I transfer. I, I want to be the person that's, that, that is transparent and it's not not only just don't listen to what I have to say on this podcast 
Watch what I do. Look at who I interact with on Twitter. You'll notice that, you know, I reply and engage at my very best to every single person. I've never once in my entire life or career looked at how many followers someone had and decided if that was going, if they were worth my time to reply or engage. Because here's the thing. I don't want to go on this journey alone. I don't want to be the person, the only person that succeeds. Because I will tell you this, like I learned over the last, especially since my, uh, my divorce and kind of having to really come in on my own self-awareness was that one of the things I recognized in myself is that, you know, being neurodiverse, I am a, I am a massive empath and being an empath doesn't always, isn't always a good thing. There are often times where I take on things that are out of my control, but I take on the feelings and the emotions of others when they're not even asking me to do so. And, and that's something that I have to work on myself. And I will also say like, you know, for me, uh, not only as someone that is neurodiverse, but also someone that wears, you know, his emotions on his sleeve. I'm not afraid to admit that, you know, watching Sean, Sean White come down the, uh, the, ha- the half pipe at the Olympics, you know, got me emotional. I was bawling my eyes out thinking about someone that, you know, dedicated their life to their, their sport and that it has to come to an end and they have to look at what next chapter is. And, and I say all of that because one of the things that I learned about myself is that, I get my joy and my happiness by seeing those around me and those that are good people that I, that I believe are good people succeed. I will tell you that, you know, me signing a contract for a speaking gig does not give me near as much joy as when someone sends me a message and says, Brian, I I took your advice and I ended up leaning in on something and I ended up making thousands of dollars. I get more joy and that's not me asking like me saying I'm better than anyone else, but it's actually, it's actually, it's actually can be a struggle sometimes because I will make sometimes decisions that aren't in my own best interest because I know that my joy and happiness oftentimes is rooted in the success and the happiness of those around me. I will say during COVID when I used my entire life traveling for 42 weeks a year when all of a sudden I was no longer traveling, I recognized that like I really was bad at taking care of myself and pampering myself and rewarding myself because I allowed my, my lifestyle, my, you know, my Marriott rewards. I'm diamond, uh, for Delta. I'm platinum for life for Marriott because I have a thousand six hundred, you know, room stays at a Marriott. And that's not a, that's not a flex. That's actually slightly embarrassing that I've stayed in a hotel so much. But I say all of this because for me, we're, we're 93 days into this podcast. We're 93 ep- episodes into this journey together. But it is, to me, the essence of we are greater than me. And so when you hear the haters on the outside saying that they think NFTs or crypto are a scam or a fraud or they're buying into the, head, the, the headlines, the thing I want you to ask yourself is like, what is the, the root of, or where is that thought coming from, from them? Like what, what is, what is it in them that allows them or has that need for them to share that view, that angle and like what is holding them back? And here's the thing, just own that. It doesn't mean that you have to fix that for them, right? Because some people, some people are not going to change. Some people are going, they would much rather spend the next five years hating on this space than spending the next five five days or five weeks learning enough about the space to make a really truly educated decision. And that also goes to people that look at things at the the highest of levels. I've said this for a while, you know, I'm a Gary Vaynerchuk fan, but I believe I got on Gary's radar originally when he first followed me back in, I think it was 2013 on Twitter. And and I don't even say I think this because Gary told me this when I had met him for the first time back that that year in 2013. He said, he's like, Brian, I I want you to know that I I followed you and you got on my radar because not because of the things that you agreed with me on, but because you took the time to challenge me and push back on things that you disagreed with me on. And I, that sat with me deep. That sat with me so deep. And then the next year, you know, and I'll, and I'll say this, 
the next year I was at this event, um, South by Southwest, and it's the year Gary gave me, uh, you know, some of his time that I, I'm, you know, beyond thankful for. But I remember what had happened was, you know, he was up, he was on stage with Jack Welsh and they were doing like kind of like a, a, a hot seat or like a coffee side talk. And after the talk, it was when Meerkat had just come out and Gary had a massive line. I mean, hundreds of people that had come up to him and were shaking hands and taking selfies. And, and I ended up going up there shaking his hand. And that's when he was like, Hey Brian, like, Hey, I want to chat with you. Like, wait for me outside, uh, the, the venue, you know, stand over there with D rock and, um, uh, we'll, we'll chat after we get done. And then I remember the, the person that was running the venue there at Austin, Texas came in and she's like, Hey, 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 Hey everybody. And Gary like stood up cause Gary was sitting on the edge of the stage and, and she's like, Hey, we have to clear out this room for the next keynote. We're sorry, everybody. Thank you guys so much for, for stay, you know, staying and waiting. But I, we can't let Gary get to all of you that are, are shaking hands or looking to shake hands. And Gary did something then that will, I will never forget. And the cool part about it was it also ties into something he did this past year in New York. And what he did, and it, you know, it does get me a little choked up because it was so impactful for me was in that moment where he had already shaken hands, kissed babies and taken selfies with 300 people at least at that time, you know, the, the venue that that room probably held, I don't know, 9,000 people. And there was about 180 people that had spent 30 minutes waiting their turn. And Gary was given the out. Not only was he given the out, but he was kind of like demanded, like, hey, Gary, you need to stop doing this. Get off the stage. You need, you know, we can't have these people in the room. And what Gary did was he's like, he put his hands up in the air and he's like, hey, hey, hey everybody, we need to get out of this room. We need to respect what they need to do. I want everybody to get in a, in an ordered line outside of this, uh, outside in the hallway, right here, outside the hallway. And I promise you, I will stick around for every last one of you that are that are here in this room right now. So that person in the very back, like, make sure that you are the one that's in the very back out there. So um, I will I will make that promise if you guys go out there and wait. And I will tell you, there's a there's a photo where I'm standing with Gary's team, and I think it's like two hours after his keynote ended, and he's still shaking hands and giving every person his like personal attention and like listening and allowing them to share, but also giving them feedback and not just giving vanity feedback or fluffy feedback, right? Like really caring about each individual person. And for me, like funny enough, like the, the impact of watching that, it actually had more of an impact on my, my years, you know, the, I don't know, the eight years, nine years since, then the time I got with Gary when we walked around the venue and I got to ask him questions and we had some, we had some quality time together. And the reason I say that is because I remember thinking like, I'm going to be that guy. You know, like if I, when I make it and I've always said like one of my goals was to the sell out Madison square gardens for an entire day event and be the person that was the, the, the keynote, the host and, and, and give people value. And, and that will happen one day. Maybe it might not be Madison Square Gardens, but Madison Square Gardens sounded like a good one for me when uh, I was kind of putting that together as like a life goal uh, back in 2010. But I say all of that because, you know, that was 2014, South by Southwest 2014. And wow, that's kind of crazy because that in, South by West, Southwest is about a month from now. But when I was in New York with Drew and I was there with a bunch of friends. We were there for the, the pop-up wine, wine party that Gary um, had tweeted out. And we went and waited in line. And, and crazy enough, we waited in line for like two hours and never got inside, um, which kind of sucked. Um, that part kind of sucked. But what had happened was Gary was inside and he recognized that there was a lot of people outside that might not make it inside. And what Gary did was he walked down the line and gave every all these people his time and his tension and and there ended up being like this herd of people that were like circling him as it happens everywhere Gary kind of goes. And he kept giving people, you know, you know, one-on-one -on -one time and letting them ask questions and taking selfies and kind of working his way through the, the, the conversation. And there's footage for it because D-Rock is the man is always capturing that. But I reason I say all of that was I remember looking at Drew and I looked at Drew and I was like, you know what? The crazy thing about it is, 
he did this in 2014 and it blew my mind because he was given an out and he had the opportunity to get out of it and he didn't. And one could argue his, his career, his wealth, his influence has tripled, maybe quadrupled since 2014. And the crazy part was I was impressed that the 2014 Gary had done it. But I think it was what he's even more impressive is that he is the same human in 2022, 2021, November in New York City, doing that same thing over and over again. And the reason I say all that, the reason I, I think it was important kind of just to set that, that standard is that we have to ask ourselves, like, how committed are we to being strong on our, on our values and the things that are most important to us? How committed are we to not allowing the haters or the naysayers or those that don't agree with the way that you're doing things to stop you from doing and, and achieving the things that you want to achieve? Because to me, that's what this is all about. And it was the same when I played poker. It was the same when I worked for the U.S. government. It was the same when I got on this journey as a speaker. The amount of people that told me that I could never make $10,000 a keynote unless I wrote a book. Less than a year later, I, would, I got booked for my first $10,000 keynote. Then I was told because I'm not a CEO, I don't have a book, and I don't have like the like the one signature story of climbing Mount Everest or um, you know getting cut from the the football team and, and making that that like my thing that I could never get booked for 50 gigs a year or make it into that 15 to 20 thousand dollar keynote range. And of course, you guys know where that story goes. But the reason I I, I put all that out there and I think it, it's fitting here on episode 93 is no, we aren't going to please everyone. And I'm always one that loves to listen and learn to feedback. I'm, I, I do not take anything uh, lightly and I appreciate everyone that, that shares. And even if you just listen to one episode and maybe it's this episode and you decide that you're, that this isn't your style, that you don't like the way that I do things. Hey, thank you for listening. Thank you for giving me an hour of your time because I know that no amount of money, nothing that we do in life allows us to get more time of the, in the day. We all have 24 hours, no matter if we're Gary Vaynerchuk or Obama or we're Sean White or we're Tyson Ross or we're, uh, you know, all of these amazing humans that are, you know, that we know we all have 24 hours in the day. And if you spent one hour of that day listening to me, like I, I, I treasure that. I appreciate that. But I think the other part of this is that it's very easy for us to get caught up in a desire to think that mass adoption is the answer. But here's the thing. The reason many of us are waiting for mass adoption, the reason many of us are, are hoping that people start you know, saying less negative things about NFTs and crypto is not because those, when, when that happens, all of a sudden the, it's going to be easier to become successful. I would actually argue right now in the early adoption phase, our ability to find success is actually greater right now than it will be when Coinbase NFT drops, than it will be when Facebook opens up their marketplace. It will be then when, when Reddit opens up their blockchain. And, but the reason that we, we often crave mass adoption is because we recognize that if those around us that we trust or that we have always been in our corner are questioning what we're doing, that it might then force us to question what we're doing and maybe you have to stop doing what we're doing. Or maybe in some cases, the reason we want mass adoption is we wanted to validate what we believe deep down. And here's what I just want to leave this podcast episode with saying is that we won't find success. We won't find happiness if it requires mass adoption, if it requires everyone to see things the same way that we do. What I believe is that you need to document and celebrate and amplify every great experience that you have in this space. I firmly believe that if you are not your own biggest cheerleader, why the hell would anyone else cheer for you? If you are not amplifying and celebrating others, 
Why would someone celebrate or amplify your content, your conversation? It's so easy for us to kind of think that, well, once it's mass adopted or after the Super Bowl when it's mainstream, then it, then things are going to be easier. Well, guess what? I think things are going to be more annoying because once more people get in this, there's going to be more people asking a lot of the same questions that either Google or official links, or they could go back and listen to earlier episodes of this podcast and they could solve those questions. I actually look at mass adoption as a, a, it's going to end up being a, a, a time where we pull the brakes a little bit. I'm like, okay, we have to stop innovating and we're going to have to just kind of wade through this entire space again. And I will tell you that the, the trends and the waves that kind of happen in this NFT space are wild. I've never been a part of a, of a space of an environment that is this um, kind of fluid. Fluid would be the, the best way I could describe it. But I think that's part of the beauty. Like I've been talking about how I don't like this whitelist, allow list, um, pre-sale, con- the, the way that this whole thing is going right now. And just this week, we're starting to see a shift away from that. We're seeing some other, some projects saying that like they're no longer going to be deploying that. But now that means we have to find new mechanics for, um, so that we avoid gas wars and that we make sure that the people that want our NFTs are actually have the ability to get them. But we also have to recognize that, that the old way wasn't right. And all of this stuff, guess what? It's just, it, it's so beautiful because it is to me, just like I was when I sat at the poker table. Each time I sat at a poker table and I played, I've played poker in probably 20 different countries, easily a hundred different casinos. Every time I sat down at the poker table, the game was different. But guess what? My goals, my version of success, my, my desire and like the things that I focused on were pretty much the same every time. But the beauty was they showed up differently. And in many cases, I had to adjust how I looked at my own success. What were the goals that I was measuring along the way? And I've had to do the same here on the podcast. I originally said I would not, I would only buy NFTs for our Mint 365 project if they were done on the website. I would not buy them in secondary market. But then I didn't anticipate the whole pre-sale thing and, and, and NFTs selling out so fast because they don't have enough public um, you know, NFTs for, for availability that I ended up having to buy them on OpenSea. And so I will, I, I will close with this. There's two things that I, I just want to challenge everyone to work on in this space. The first one is patience. And that's a struggle for me. I am a press the damn button, go get it type of guy. I, my daughters laugh all the time. Like I'm pretty good at being patient on others, but I don't have very much patience for myself. Uh, I want things and I, and I want and I, but I, I recognize that patience is essential in here. But the number two thing that is the skill set that I want people to take away with is you need to understand and embrace the ability to roll with the punches. And what I mean by that is you have to be able to take the good with the bad. You have to be able to take the risk versus the reward. You have to understand that if you're opening up for a right hook, that it's going to leave you vulnerable to get stuck in the face. You have to recognize that if you're just playing it safe and having your gloves up, that you'll never win, but you might make it longer. But is that how you want to actually fight this fight? You have to ask yourself each round, each time, what am I learning from my opponents? What am I learning from this environment? How can I become better? It's not about being perfect. It's not about having all of the right punches or all the right answers, but rather how do you roll with the punches when things don't go in your way, when, when crypto all of a sudden starts dipping in price, just as you start getting a hang of the NFTs and now your complete strategy has to change. How open to you or how open are you at rolling with the punches at allowing yourself to have that strong jaw, allowing yourself to maybe hold on to your opponent and get through the round just so to survive another day. My friends, thanks so much for coming on this journey. We've made it through 93 episodes. I am thankful for each and every one of you. I hope you have an amazing day. Please keep those comments coming, the good, the bad, the ugly. I want it all. I appreciate everyone. I want to thank everyone 
for sharing out this podcast, for, for, for talking about the podcast with others. I know so many of you have dropped it in different discord channels. I've had, I had the, the team at world of women, the team at boss beauties and the team at just this week. Um, what was the other one? There was a third one projects that I'm not involved in. I don't have any of them. They reached out to me and said, Hey, people shared your podcast in our, in our, in our discord. And we just want to say thank you. And I just want to say thank you to all of those that are, are sharing and amplifying this message because this is a we. This show is about we. If nobody listened, I, I wouldn't be doing the show. If if nobody came on this journey on you know giving feedback and, and kind of building me up, I would never have the motivation or inspiration to do these episodes every day. But thanks to all of us together, we've made it through 93 episodes. Number 100 is right around the corner. And I can't wait for episode 193. Until tomorrow, my friends, make it a great day. Cheers. Woohoo. All right. Thanks so much, everyone on the video side. Yeah, this is my 2007 World Series of Poker. Actually, I think I have, I don't know where my, oh, here, is this my coin? Um, there you go. World Series of Poker. Um, that was the, what year is this one? 2010, uh, this was actually, 2010 was my, it was my second best year um, cashing, the, the amount of money I won that year at the World Series of Poker, but it was actually my best year of results. So I made uh, I made it further in, in, uh, in different uh, tournaments than I had uh, in uh, previous years or, or the next years. Uh, 2012 actually ended up being the years I made the most money but I didn't get the furthest because I just made the most money in like the uh, the buy-ins were larger that I was playing in because of my sponsor and such. So I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Uh, I am a numbers guy. I, I love that so many of you have jumped on the journey with these numbers. Uh, you know, yesterday was uh, 021122, which is kind of a cool number uh, as well. Um, but uh Make it a great day, my friends. Um, today is actually, what, 21222? Uh, so <laughs> with that uh, being said, thanks for sticking around. A little bit of the after show, a little bit of the of the conversation. And uh, some of you saw on Twitter, <sighs> yesterday I recorded two full podcast episodes with video before I realized that my audio was completely screwed. Um, and now I'm like, I can tell you I'm a little bit nervous and a little bit excited to like, listen to this audio back right away because I tested it twice before we went, but you never know because I tested it yesterday and then all of a sudden it went haywire, but uh, I digress. Uh, thanks for subscribing. Thanks for pounding that bell and uh, till tomorrow. Cheers. <laughs>